Welcome, I'm Sega Lord X, and in this episode we are going to be taking a look at more Sega Saturn ports from other machines. These ports can come from the arcade, they can come from different generations, they can come from machines of the same generation as the Sega Saturn. They just came from some other place. We've got nine games to look at total here. Let's get started. The Saturn wasn't loaded with many beat-em-ups, but in mid-1995, Technosoft would release to Japan only Naketsu Oyako, often referred to as Hot-Blooded Family. This tried-and-true brawler is about as close to a true Streets of Rage as the Saturn would ever get. Gameplay is a collection of genre staples, with simple combos, throws, and special moves making up the bulk of the experience. Control is tight and responsive, and there's enough differences between the playable characters to warrant multiple playthroughs and strategies. Graphics are solid, with large, colorful sprites and great animation rounding out an overall impressive presentation. Sound design and composition is of particular note here, as the stage music is exceptional, with tracks rivaling some of the best beat-em-ups from the past. It's the kind of game you'll want to pump up the stereo with, and its ability to influence your enjoyment of the game is the way great sound design can really attribute to the overall experience. Collectively, the game's silly characters and locations keeps things easy going and there's enough fun packed into the gameplay and presentation to bring you back again and again, especially for its fantastic couch co-op two-player mode. This one is of course expensive, and will run you around $100 if you follow the auctions as they pop up. If you're a fan of the genre and have interest, I really do recommend you take a look, and if the price is a bit too high, Take a look at the import PS1 version of which it's based, as that version is a little cheaper and plays just as great. Early 1997 would bring us the classic Capcom franchise, Mega Man, in the form of Mega Man 8. This outing for the Blue Bomber would include animated cutscenes and voice acted characterization both of which add virtually nothing to the overall experience. In fact, the voice acting is rather terrible in areas and can actually detract from the game. Luckily, Mega Man 8 plays pretty solid, with tried and true mechanics from the various other games in the series. Stage and enemy design is greatly inspired from the other games in the series as well, and should please fans of those games. Graphically, the overall presentation is strengthened by great animation and color usage, but I must confess to be slightly underwhelmed by the lack of effects and rather simplistic backgrounds and environments. Both the Saturn and PS1 were capable of some pretty 2D effects and background tricks, and it appears Capcom kept things safe in this production. Sound and music are nothing special, but also does nothing to make the experience bad. Of particular note, there are a number of soundtrack differences between this and its PS1 counterpart. Mega Man 8 is an incredibly expensive game due to its rarity, and can go for hundreds of dollars. If you have any interest at all, I highly recommend looking at Rockman 8 for the Japanese Saturn. It's far cheaper and more readily available. Shortly after Mega Man 8, we'd get Mega Man X4 in mid-1997, continuing on the Mega Man X series in 32-bit, we'd finally get a presentation worthy of the generation. Loaded to the brim with transparency effects, background animations, massive bosses, and large detailed sprites, this Mega Man game truly brought the series back on track. You also had the ability to choose between either Mega Man or Zero at the start of the game, changing the story and altering the gameplay and how you approach the stages, often in radical fashion. Mega Man was able to attack at distance easily from the very beginning, while Zero needed to dash and melee attack often to be effective. This gave the game great replay value, 
especially since the game was fairly difficult to begin with. I also really appreciated the soundtrack, which relied heavily on rock and techno themes, often at fast pacing to really jazz you up for the stage you were on. This one isn't as expensive as Mega Man 8 in the West, but the Japanese version of Rockman X4 is still significantly cheaper and easier to obtain. I recommend that route again, as the story adds little to the overall experience. Mid-1997 would see the Taito arcade game Pulley Rula, released as part of the Arcade Gears line by Xing. This simplistic beat-em-up supports two players with the very basic mechanics of attack and jump. The story goes that some guy just shows up one day in your town, stealing the time key and altering the flow of time. You go on a mission to retrieve the key and fight through various towns and stages along the way. Graphics and music here are a bit on the simplistic side, but the large sprites that are well animated hold the presentation together overall. Sound effects can be grating and are overused far too much, drowning out most of the soundtrack. Pulley Rula is a product of its age, as the original arcade release was six years old prior to this, and beat-em-ups have come a long way since. While the game does have merit for its unique art design and two-player co-op, it sells upwards of $100 plus, making it hard to recommend, especially with the PS1 version going for half that. Late 1996 would see the release of Black Dawn, a 3D arcade-style helicopter shooter published by Virgin Interactive. This game has the very unique ability to drastically change how you play it. Switch around the control methods in a few checkboxes, and it's a third person blastathon with easy controls. Change those settings again, and you'll get something much closer to a simulation style first person shooter. I prefer the arcade style approach, and while Black Dawn's 3D engine has aged significantly over the years, the game still plays decent with fun, easy to understand missions, and an easy to read map that clearly points out your objectives. The game also has fairly comprehensive lists of weapons, and ways to dispatch your foes, and the easy to use lock on system guarantees you'll be kicking ass in no time. Flight control can take time to adjust to, especially since many of the functions require multiple button presses, but by the end of the first stage, you should be comfortable enough to rain death from above effectively. Black Dawn is a cheap game that is easily found, so if you have any interest in the genre, give it a look. It's one of the best games of its type on the machine. Taito would bring its arcade hits, Chase HQ, and Special Criminal Investigation to the Saturn in 1996, combined into one disc called Taito's Chase HQ plus SCI. These arcade perfect ports of the 1988 and 1989 racing combat games play exactly how you remember them. Take control of your super sport crime fighting vehicle and hunt down the targeted criminal. Chase HQ was a rather simple game even in its day. You run down the bad guy, crash into him a bunch of times, and arrest him. The game is ultra short, and a player with sufficient skill will easily beat the game in no time. Fortunately, SCI is a slightly deeper game, with more enemies to deal with, and the ability to shoot foes as well. Graphics here are reminiscent of Sega's own Super Scalar line with cool tunnel and sky effects, making appearances at various times. Music and sound effects are straight out of the arcade and serve the game well overall. The price tag on this one is north of $50 these days, and that's a hard sell for games of this age, especially since they can be beaten really fast. If you were a fan of the arcade though, these versions absolutely rock and bring the arcade home exactly as you'd expect from the Sega Saturn.
Early 1996 would bring us the action platformer Skeleton Warriors by Neversoft of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and Guitar Hero fame. Based on the short-lived cartoon series of the same name, this 2.5D side-scroller has the makings of a very decent game. The pre-rendered sprites are large and colorful, lacking the style's usual dithering. The backgrounds have great scrolling layers, and there's great depth in the area the gameplay takes place on. Gameplay is simple melee and ranged attacks, but it's responsive and smooth. So what's the problem then you ask? It's the repetition in the gameplay. Because there are only a handful of ways to attack, the endless barrage of enemies thrown at you become tedious to dispatch, never really letting off long enough for you to take in your surroundings or appreciate some other area of gameplay. I believe the developers knew this and attempted to rectify the issue by injecting 3D polygon levels where you ride a jet bike. This only intensifies the problems, however, as these sections are slow and graphically unappealing. Worse, to intensify difficulty, levels begin assaulting you with small, hard-to-see enemies that are masked by the dark backgrounds, making mandatory hits a regular part of the experience. One major bright spot in all this is the game's incredible music score, which takes cues from the epic tracks in older movies like Conan the Barbarian and The Beastmaster. It adds an incredible amount of atmosphere to each stage, and nearly every track is worth listening to. Skeleton Warriors isn't a bad game at all. You just see flashes of something more here and there, and it leaves you wanting exactly that. Konami would release all three volumes of the PS1 series MSX collection in one disc on the Saturn in mid-1998, labeling it Konami Antiques MSX Collection Ultra Pack. This compilation of 30 games spans many of Konami's releases for the MSX computer system, which was wildly popular in Japan. It contains classic games from their library, such as Gradius, Salamander, Parodius, Twinbee, and Time Pilot, as well as some MSX exclusive sports games and other oddities. These likely aren't the versions of the games you remember, as they were heavily scaled back to run on the MSX hardware at the time, meaning that heavy concessions were made to sprite and background details, as well as the scrolling smoothness for many of the games. Some of these have held up remarkably well, however, especially the single screen games. Years ago, this game sold for a pittance on eBay, and it was worth owning when it was cheap. Recent years has seen the game explode in value, now regularly being sold upwards of $100. This price is ludicrous to anyone not swayed by heavy nostalgia for the MSX, and I cannot recommend it at that price. It's a fair compilation and a great reminder of what it was like to game on Microsoft's little-known platform, but its asking price for these games put it well beyond what it's worth. Released first in mid-1997 in Europe, BMG Interactive would publish Mass Destruction for the Saturn. This mission-based overhead shooter immediately conjures up memories of Return Fire, and its brand of action. You start out with a choice of three tanks, one built for speed, one for toughness, and one right in between. Missions are typically set around destroying something of the enemies, or rescuing a fellow team member. The gameplay is easy to understand and the map very easy to follow. You always know what to do next and where to go. Enemy varieties range from foot soldiers and other tanks, with each stage gradually becoming more and more populated with potential threats. The game runs smoothly, but lacks any real detail to stress the engine, with plain texture work and simple geometry. Gameplay is tight and fast, however, and remains responsive even when the action is heavy. Mass Destruction won't win any depth awards to be sure, 
but its fun arcade style action is a blast to just sit back and engage in. There's no complex control scheme to come to grips with, or some ridiculous objective you don't know how to do to worry you to death. Simply jump in your tank and blow stuff up. Perhaps the most puzzling thing about this game is how the hell it's remained so cheap over the years. There are Saturn games far, far worse than this that sell for way more, and at its meager asking price of around $20, it's an absolute steal for the Sega Saturn. Now in doing the research for this episode, I came upon the realization, man, that the Saturn is just loaded with ports. I mean, there are a ton of the things on the machine, and I've not even scratched the surface of how many of these things there actually are. So there's going to be a ton more of these particular episodes. I'm also going to start looking at the exclusive game library more for the Saturn. And I've touched upon that recently as well, and realized I've got a lot more to go with that too. Either way, more Sega Saturn goodness is coming your way, guaranteed. I'm Sega Lord X, greatly appreciate you guys watching, I'll catch you next time.